Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee to the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, a time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them at the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was, an, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with him, sorry, with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known saying the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. This is a reading of God's word. Oh, so a couple of weeks ago, we started a new sermon series to the book of Luke to kick off the Advent season. And this morning, as we celebrate Christmas Sunday, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, which probably has the most detailed account of the original Christmas story. This is where it all began. But before we get there, I want to start off by asking you a simple question. And the question is this. If you could be born in any time in history, past, present, or future, when would that be for you? Hey, if you could be born in any time in human history, when would that be for you and why? Think about that for a moment. And then what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor and share your answer with the person next to you. Okay, so go ahead and do that now. When would you be born and why? Okay, all right. How many of you guys said the Renaissance period? Anyone? No? Okay. You know, that used to be my answer for the longest time. I, I, was, a I was a history major in college, and I loved that period. But the only way that I would be born in the Renaissance period is if I was born an aristocrat or a ruler of some sort. There's no way that I would be born as a peasant. Right? But I, I want us to stretch our imagination a little more and continue with this for a little bit, okay? So you, whatever, whatever, whatever uh, era that you're born in, now imagine that you get to pick and choose what your life looks like. So think for a moment, just imagine for a moment, in that era that you're born in, whether it's in the past or currently or in the future, where would you be born geographically? Who will your parents be? What ethnicity we be born into. Think about that for a moment, okay? And then now, start to write out the rest of your life story. 
You get to choose precisely how your life will pan out. What will you look like? Who are your childhood friends? What are some of the hobbies you pick up? What natural talents do you have? What college would you go to? What kind of occupation would you have? Imagine you get to write every aspect of your life. Wouldn't that be amazing? If we can pick and choose precisely how our life plans out. You see, this is a fun little exercise, and the reality is that none of us can do that, right? We can't decide every aspect of our lives. But this is fun because depending on how we answer the, the set of questions that I just asked, it reveals a lot about what's really deep in our hearts. It reveals what we value. It reveals what we long for but can't really have. And while it's true that none of us have the ability to pick and choose how our life plans out, there was one person in human history who had that ability, and that was Jesus Christ. And what's fascinating about Luke chapter 2 is we actually get to see how God answers the very question we all spend time thinking about. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at these three points to kind of guide us along. And as we do so, we're going to learn more about who God is and what really matters to him. Because God got to choose precisely how he would, in what period he would be born, and at what his life would look like. And so the three points we'll be looking at today are these. Number one, the historical context of Jesus' birth. Number two, the condition of Jesus' birth. Number three, the crowd that was invited to his birth. Okay. The context, the condition, and the crowd. First of all, the historical context of Jesus' birth. In Luke chapter 2, in verse 1, this is how it starts. It says, In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered to his own town each to his own town. Now, we have to understand that there are different types of literary genres out there, right? And we can typically tell what category story falls into by the way it's told. So, for example, if I started a story by saying, once upon a time in a distant land far, far away, we immediately know that this is a fictional story. And so our, our mind switches gear, and we're ready to hear a made-up story. But if I were to start, start a story by saying one September morning in 2001 under the Bush administration, right, you would know where this is leading. You would know that I'm not telling a fake story, but this is an actual event, and I'm telling an event that actually took place. And this is important because when Luke is writing this letter, and in verses 1 and 2, what we see is that not a single person would have mistaken this story to be a fictional story. Luke is intentional in giving detailed accounts that are pegged in real historical people and events. And so what do we know about the historical context in which Jesus was born? In verse 1, it says that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. So what we know is that Jesus was born during the reign of Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And so the question is, who is Caesar Augustus? You see, most of us recognize the name Julius Caesar, right? He's probably the most famous figure in Roman history. But not many of us know that Julius, or Caesar Augustus is in fact the most powerful and successful leader to ever rule the Roman Empire. Caesar Augustus was born Octavius. That was his birth given name. And Octavius was actually the great nephew of Julius Caesar himself. And from a young age, Julius Caesar saw that Octavius showed so much potential that he would, lead them, he would take him in his military campaigns. And because he saw the potential that he, he was displaying, Julius Caesar eventually adopted Octavius as his own son and named him Octavian. Now, fast forward a few years, and when Julius Caesar was assassinated by the senators, they found in Julius Caesar's will that Octavian be the sole heir of his entire belonging, including the massive army that he commanded. 
And what we know from historical accounts is that Octavian then, in just under 10 years, takes this army and he begins to kill off all of his enemies, one by one. He succeeds in wiping out all of his enemies, and he even kills off his former allies that he perceives as potential threat to him in the near future. You see, Octavian was a very shrewd, calculated, ruthless person. And as a result, he eventually succeeded where Julius Caesar failed. Octavian becomes the very first emperor in Roman history. You see, prior to this, Rome was a republic, meaning it, Rome was run by elected officials and senators. But when Octavian took power and when he began to wipe off all of his enemies, Octavian grew so rapidly, so immensely in power that he eventually got to a place where no one could challenge him. And so the senators were forced to give up their power and crown him as emperor, king, for the first time in Roman history, for the first time in 500 years. And so in 27 BC, Octavian takes on the title Augustus, meaning the exalted one. And Rome goes from being a republic to now the Roman Empire. This is who Octavian is. Now, because Octavian took command of the entire Roman army, and he was the first person in human history to do it, he became the most powerful man to ever live up to this point. And with the sheer force of power that Octavian had, he establishes what's called now the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. You see, Octavian, because he was able to con control all the soldiers in the Roman Empire, he ended centuries of internal strife. He was able to secure the borders. He strengthened the military. He founded the police and the fire departments. He upgraded the infrastructure so that there's easier traveling within the empire. And the list just goes on and on and on. Octavian brought upon the golden era in Rome. And this is where our story picks up. Caesar Augustus, sent out a decree to have an empire-wide census so that he can better tax his subjugates. Israel was under the reign of the Roman Empire. And so Joseph, living in Israel, had no choice but to go back to his hometown, the, the hometown of his tribe, right, and to register for the census. Now, we have to keep in mind that this wasn't an ideal situation for Joseph and Mary. We saw last week that Mary is pregnant at this point, and around this time, Mary is about to give birth at any given moment. The last thing you want to do when you're expecting a child at any, any given moment is to go on a long, arduous journey, right? We don't do that. We wait for the child to come. We set up our home. We set up our situation. Everything is ready. People are on standby. We have game plan for what to do when the moment the, the delivery begins, the labor begins, right? But for Mary and Joseph, they had no choice but to be forced to go to Bethlehem during this terrible time, right, timing, to go and to register. And so we can say, oh, that's so unfortunate for Mary. What a terrible timing for her. And from a historical perspective, right, it could seem as though Jesus had no choice but to be born in Bethlehem. He should have been born in Nazareth where Mary and Joseph lived, but he had no choice but to be born in Bethlehem because of the decree of this powerful emperor. But that's not the case. It's actually the other way around. Look at this comment, uh, look at this, um, R.C. Sproul uh, in his commentary said this. He said, it was no coincidence that this imperial decree of Caesar's happened to take place at this time forcing them to make the journey to Bethlehem. Here is the most powerful emperor in the world acting out the decree of God himself. Caesar Augustus, in the final analysis, was but a pawn in the hands of the Lord God omnipotence. Remember how the prophet Micah had prophesied. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. 
You see, this prophecy, Micah was written about 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus. And in this letter is a prophecy, God's decree, that a Savior, a Messiah, would be born specifically in Bethlehem. You see, the location of Jesus' birth was already established even before Rome was in existence. And when the time came for Jesus to arrive here on earth, since Mary had no reason to go to Bethlehem to give birth, and that humanly didn't make sense, God used Caesar Augustus, the most powerful man on earth, as an instrument to carry out his will. In other words, the decree of Augustus only came at the time it did because God said so. Here's what a New Testament scholar says. He says, Luke portrays Augustus as the unknowing agent of God whose decree leads to the fulfillment of the promised rise of a special ruler from Bethlehem. The birth of Jesus was intentionally during the reign of the most powerful person on earth. Why? To juxtapose and contrast between that of God and man. You see, even the most powerful man on earth had no choice but to submit to the will of God. So what does this tell us about God himself? The first point is this, that God is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. God sits above the rest. He is omnipotent. He is God Almighty. And even the most powerful, influential people here on earth who seemingly have control over this world, who seem to dictate every aspect of our own lives, are still subjects to this Almighty God. But I want to pause here for a moment and ask you this question Is this your view of God? Do you truly believe in the heart of hearts? that God is fully in control, that he is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords? Or have we made God so small small in our minds that we would rather place our ultimate hope and trust in people, fellow human beings, who are in a position of power and influence? The first takeaway point from today's story is this. God is the king of all kings, and even Caesar Augustus, the exalted one, is only but an instrument in God's greater plan. Second, we look at the condition of Jesus' birth, and this is what it says starting in verse 6. It says, while they were there, Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem, it said that this, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there's no place for them in the end. Now, when we think of the nativity scene for us today, right, chances are it's a very picturesque, heartwarming scene, right? You have the angels in the sky, the bright star shining on, in, on the stable, surrounded by shepherds and the wise, uh, wise kings providing their gifts, right? And in the center is Mary and Joseph looking down at a peaceful baby in a straw-cushioned manger. Not to mention beautifully groomed animals in pairs all looking down and admiring this sleeping Jesus, right? That's probably the picture of our nativity scene. But is that what really happened? Was that the reality? Absolutely not. That's That couldn't be any further from the truth. Look at what one commentator, look how one commentator describes how it might have been based on how things actually were in the first century. He said this. In Bethlehem, the accommodations for travelers were primitive. The Eastern Inn was the crudest of arrangements. Typically, it was a series of stalls built on the inside of an enclosure, like a cave, an opening onto a common yard where the animals were kept. All the innkeeper provided was fodder for the animals and a fire to cook on. On that cold day when the expectant parents arrived, nothing at all was available, not even one of those crude stalls. And despite the urgency, no one would make room for them. 
So it was probably in the common courtyard where the travelers' animals were tethered that Mary gave birth to Jesus, with only Joseph attending her. Joseph probably wept as much as Mary did, seeing her pain, the stinking barnyard, their poverty, people's indifference, the humiliation, the sense of utter helplessness, feeling shame and not being able to provide for young Mary on the night of her travail. All that would make a man either curse or cry. You see, if we imagine that Jesus was born in a freshly swept county fair stable, we miss the whole point. It was wretched scandalous. There was sweat and pain and blood as, and cries as Mary reached up to the heavens for help. The earth was cold and hard. The smell of birth mixed with the stench of manure and acrid straw made a contemptible bouquet. You see, in our time, we've lost the shock factor that the first century listeners would have immediately picked up on. You see, we've sanitized the nativity scene so that it's marketable to the masses. But the reality was that it was horrifying. People would have gasped as they heard how Jesus was actually born. There was no running water and electricity. There was no privacy. There was no midwife to help with the delivery for, this, for these young teenagers who were about to become first-time parents. All they are given are pieces of cloth and a feeding trough to place the baby in after it's born. Not only that, but in verse 3, we're told that everyone in the country was on the move. Everyone in the country, because of the census, had to go back to their hometown, meaning it was packed, and chances are there were animals just all around. No doubt it would have been noisy and chaotic, not to mention the amount of feces and, and urine all around. Right? We've sanitized and we've excluded all of this thing. But the fact is, Mary gave birth in some of the most horrendous environment one could ever give birth in. You know, I thought about this. Why would you put a brand newborn baby in a feeding trough? That thing is probably slimy with films of, of you know, like I, I try to imagine this. But that was a better option to put it in that thing. It wasn't sanitized, it wasn't clean, it wasn't brand new. They probably use, they probably empty the water or the food that they fed the animals in and said, here, place your baby here. Why? Because that was a better option than to put it on the ground. Right? And then I imagine the amount of insects and the bacteria that an environment like this would breed. This was a heart-wrenching scene. It's unimaginable. But you know, we have to keep in mind that even this detailed aspect of Jesus' birth was intentional. God chose to be born in this precise environment, surrounded by feces and urine and all these other terrible things. Why? We can't know for sure but this is what I imagine. I believe that the horrid condition in which Jesus was born is a visual representation of the condition of this world is that Jesus entered into. His coming to earth was infinitely more difficult and horrendous than the environment in which Jesus was born. You see, you and I don't have a reference point to compare this world to. This is all we have. This is all we know. So we think this, is, this isn't too bad. But for God, he does have a reference point. And for God, from his vantage point, this world is full of brokenness, chaos, pain, and suffering. It's full of death and decay. It's dark and cold. And there's a sense of helplessness all around. It's filled with grotesque sins that breed greater sins. And none of this is the way it's supposed to be. We might think life here on earth is pretty great, but we have no idea what we're missing out on. You see, we can look at the way that Jesus was born in this condition, and we have something compared to in our modern time, right? The way that we think the standard ought to be for how you give birth. And so compared to this, it falls so short. 
infinitely greater is the gap between where God is and where we are here on earth. And I believe that that's the reason why Jesus was born the way he did. Forget the nativity scene that you see on the front lawns or on the front of the Hallmark cards. That's not what it was. It was a terrifying picture, but it was supposed to show the brokenness, the filth that is this world. So what else can we learn about God through this story? This is what we learn that God forfeited his heavenly throne and he willingly entered into a broken world full of sin and death. And so if we combine points one and two, then we see that the king of all kings willingly entered into the worst of all situations. And that leads to my final point, the invited crowd. After Jesus is born, this is what Luke's account says, starting in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. What we know from Luke's account is that the shepherds were the first to ever hear the gospel story. Not only that, but the shepherds were the only people on earth to be invited to see this baby child. Right? This is in, this baby Jesus. This is incredible honor. And we have to keep in mind that you don't just invite anyone to your newborn child, right? The birth of your newborn child. What we see is that this is the most exclusive, hand-selected invitation, and it went specifically to the shepherds. Now, on the surface level, this makes a lot of sense, right? Because the Bible portrays the shepherds in a very positive light. And a lot of the biblical heroes, people like Abraham, Moses, King David, they were all shepherds themselves. And Jesus himself identifies as the good shepherd. So on the surface level, it makes sense that the angels would go to the shepherds and say, come and see this child that is born, right? Because they seem to be the most qualified people. They seem to be the, the, the right occupation and the right sort of people to be invited into the presence of God himself. But what we miss, right, when we think in those ways, is that this is not how the shepherds were perceived in the first century. We have to understand the Bible through the lens of the original audience to better understand what's really going on. And this is what we know. The shepherds in the first century were considered to be some of the most despised and rejected people in society. Here's what one commentator says. In a rabbi list of thieving and cheating occupations, we find that of the shepherd. This classification of herds as notorious robbers and cheats means that like the publicans and tax collectors, they were deprived of civil rights. They could not fulfill a judicial office, or be admitted in court as a witness. Another commentator said this, shepherds, are dis- shepherds were despised by the good, respectable people of that day. According to the Mishnah, shepherds were under a ban. They were regarded as thieves, and the only people lower than the shepherds at that particular time in Jewish history were lepers. Finally, here's what another commentator said. In that day, shepherds were considered to be at the lowest rung of that social ladder. Their work not only kept them away from the temple and the synagogue, but it made them ceremonially unclean. 
They were labeled as ceremonially unclean and therefore unable to enter into the temple to worship God. You see, the shepherds were not good people. There's a reason why their testimony is not accepted in the court of law. There's a reason why they're, not, they're banned from worshiping in the temple. They're known to be people who regularly rob others and lie and cheat to take advantage of other people. Right? These are not the sort of people that you want to meet when you're by yourself in the middle of the night. These are, group of, these are a group of people who are nomads wandering with the sheep, and there's no accountability for them. So they get to do whatever they want, and they get away with it. And they take advantage of that situation. These are not the sort of people you invite over to your house. Right? And because of this, the shepherds have become something like the untouchables in their society. They were forced out inside the city, city gates of any, any society that they were in, and they were labeled as ceremonially unclean. If you came in close contact with the shepherd, then you have to cleanse yourself before you can go and worship God. The shepherds were the most despised and rejected people. And yet the angels go specifically to the shepherds of all people, Right? They entrust the shepherds with the good news and invite them to behold this newborn child. And so again, the question is why? Because God intentionally did this. He wrote this aspect of his birth as well. So why did God go to the shepherds of all the people that he could have invited? And that leads to the final truth about who God is. The king of all kings who came into this dark and broken world, came to seek and save the lost. The purpose of Jesus coming on earth was to save sinners. Not the righteous people, not the holy people, but people who needed saving. To redeem the untouchables, to make the unclean clean. To show that no one is beyond the reach of God's love and mercy. What's amazing about this story is that the shepherds were not out in the field looking up at the sky and meditating on God's word and praying and worshiping and seeking God and waiting on the Lord. No, they were simply doing what they were doing, probably some sort of sin, right? And yet, while they were not even looking to worship God, looking to the sky, we see that the angel came and visited the shepherds. And that shows that it's not... We, it's not us who go looking for God, but it's God who comes looking for us. And if even the shepherds can be forgiven of their sin, then surely no one is ever excluded. No one can ever be disqualified from the love and the forgiveness and the acceptance of God. And then here's the one last thing about the shepherds. The unique thing about the shepherds is that they knew they were bad people. They knew they were rejected. They were constantly told so. They knew that they didn't have the right to stand before a holy God. They knew their sins were ever before them. So they knew that they were utterly lost and hopeless and rejected. And that's a good place to be if you want to experience God's grace. And the question I have for you is do you know how sinful and wretched you are? That we are no better than the shepherds. That we are actually the shepherds in this story. You know, at the beginning of this sermon, I asked you to imagine a perfect life scenario, right? And a life in which you get to decide every aspect of your life. Think back to how you answered that, how you answered, uh, that question. And then let me ask you this now. What was the driving factor in every decision making of your perfect life? Chances are all of us made every single decision about ourselves, about elevating ourselves, about making our situation best, making ourselves the focal point of glory and comfort and wealth and all these other things. Chances are, when you imagine the perfect life, it was solely self-centered. And this is the human heart. 
It constantly wants to take the center stage. It wants to be Caesar Augustus, to be exalted, to have it all. You know what the problem is? We just can't. We just can't. But if we can, we would. That's our heart. And because we have this heart, we are constantly at war with God himself. We don't want anyone above us. We want to be in that place. Even now, every time we sin, we say, my will over yours. I will do what I want, whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not. Right? We have to understand that we are the shepherds in this story. And yet the beauty of the Christmas story is that the king of all kings came into this broken world to save the worst of all sinners, including you and me. And the Christmas story is only the opening scene of Jesus' life. It's only the beginning, and we know where the story leads. We know that by the end of Jesus' life, he willingly goes to the cross to die on our behalf. And I was thinking about this. Jesus was born at the same time that Caesar Augustus was ruler of Rome. Caesar Augustus brought Pax Romana. Caesar Augustus brought peace in Rome through violence and by killing off all of his enemies. But Christ brought peace on earth by dying for his enemies. That is the difference. And when we begin to behold this beautiful king of all kings who came specifically for the sole purpose of saving us, then we begin to respond the same way the shepherds did, going out and praising him. And that's what the Christmas story is all about. And so I invite you, as we reflect on the birth, the life, and the death of Jesus, that we would look at this magnificent king who has forfeited all that he had to come after us, to die for us, so that we would be exalted, not by our own effort, but by, but by the very death of Jesus Christ himself. And this is why we take communion every single week, because we remind ourselves at what cost we are saved, at what cost we are forgiven. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this is my body that is given for you. Every time you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took a cup, and he said, this is the new covenant which I've shed for you. When you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. This Christmas morning, may we remember that Jesus gave up his life so that you and I would have an eternal one. We're going to take the communion together. If you do not have a communion cup, please raise your hand, and thank you, Elder Peter will... We want, we're going to take the first layer together, and after prayer, we'll take it together, and we'll bring the cup out there. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, here on earth. We know in John 3, 16, that it's because, because you love us, because you love the world so much, that you sent your one and only begotten Son, so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is the good news. And so we thank you for that. And then to pray that during this Christmas season, we would reflect on this beautiful truth. And that like the shepherds who went away worshiping you as a result of what they witnessed, may we too respond in gratitude, and worship to the gospel that we heard. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.